This weekend, I had intended to give an update on the Journey of Faith pastoral planning process, and you'll see that I placed uh, some links to more information on the process in our bulletin, and noted that you'll soon be receiving a letter from our Seven Parish family planning team. But as this past week progressed, and I reflected over various conversations from the last few months since coming here, it's become clear to me that our parishes need something related, but a little bit different first. Before we can move forward into the future with our journey of faith, we need acknowledged what we've gone through in the past, including our losses, sorrows, and pains. You know, today's reading, we are all about God's healing as God heals the lepers, both in the Old Testament and through Jesus in the New. And this need for healing is going to be unique to every person, certainly, but also unique to the experiences of individual parishes. And so that means this weekend I'm giving three different homilies, because I want, there's some specific things that I want to say to each of our three communities. And so this homily is designed to specifically talk to members of St. Jane Francis Parish here. But of course, those from St. Mary's or St. Joseph or from other parishes, I'm certain that you'll receive a lot from this as well. But from our other two parishes, I do encourage you to go and listen to the homilies that I'll speak to your parish in particular as well. Uh, Always links in our bulletin to uh, where I have them recorded. So, looking back, it was in 2007 when St. Jane Francis and St. Mary's were connected. And then in 2019 is when Pierce joined our Tri-Parish family. And there's been good things, certainly, from our connection together, but also some loss. Fifteen years ago, you were able to attend Mass here in Randolph every day of the week, and multiple options on Sunday. And it was a loss when you had to begin splitting masses between two parishes. Not only masses, but also the priest's time and his attention were divided. And now with three parishes served by one priest, it's another loss, splitting masses and the priest's attention even further. And since we tend to go when and where Mass is most convenient to us, there began an an intermingling among the three parishes, which is good when we're learning to work together, but perhaps not so good when each individual parish feels less like a united community. The rotation of Masses that we have has also brought good and bad as well. While it was meant to bring a level of of fairness among our parishes, it also means that every fourth month, the communities that gather together at Mass look just a little bit different. You miss the people that you used to see here at Mass, and you find it difficult to reach out to those you do not yet know. And as you were still trying to wrap yourselves around that new situation... COVID happened. And so much fear and uncertainty at that time. And at the moment that you needed God the most, when you needed at most Jesus' consolation through the sacraments, he was less available to you. We practiced social distancing, but it became not just physical, but a spiritual isolation from each other. The disruption of the normal way of doing things, of not knowing what may happen in the future, legitimate concerns that could potentially lead to to irrational fears, heaviness, discouragement, confusion, perhaps even hopelessness, questioning the future or where God is present. And I saw those kinds of dangers when I was in my previous parishes during that time. And so I I tried to help people to be able to notice those thoughts of, of desolation that could arise to teach them how to use, in particular, St. Ignatius's discernment of spirits to, to figure out 
what are our thoughts and, and feelings and desires that we're going through? And to recognize what things are from God and accept those things, but what things are, f- are from the enemy, from Satan and his lies and his temptations, and to reject those things. And unfortunately, I know that there are individuals who, from that time, were cut off from the community and even God, and who may even now be trying to continue with life without connection to God's family or His sacraments. And to add to this, wounds caused by past clergy abuse, current political turmoil, constant cultural attacks of Christian values, nastiness on social media, economic burdens, and thoughts of conflict abroad. Not to mention the unique sorrows and burdens that you might have in your own individual lives. And now, even before you can fully process all of these losses, you seem to be faced by another one, with a new realignment through this round of pastoral planning. And so your parish, again, must divide the ministry of two priests among seven parishes spanning some 70 miles from Plainview to Ponker. And while we're nearing the time in which our family planning team must submit a proposal to the Archbishop, the uncertainties will continue to be in our mind until this is made public and final. Where will the priests live? What will the office look like? Most of all, what will Mass be? If you've looked at any of the Archdiocesan parameters on the Journey of Faith website, you would know that the, the limits of how many Masses will be ex- can be expected per priest. And that means that in not only our seven parish family, but in pretty much all other rural families as well, there will be some churches likely to cease having Sunday Mass. And that is a loss that is most difficult for us all. I'd been planning to talk more about grief and mourning in the future, but I think that now is the right time. Just as someone must grieve the loss of a loved one who dies, so too do we need to grieve other losses, including the losses that we've experienced through the changes in our parish over the years. One task of mourning is to accept the reality of the loss. And so far, when, I, when I've preached about the journey of faith, it's been to try to help us to be able to understand why we have to go through these different changes. And that can help us to accept those changes and those losses that come with it. But that's just intellectually. There's also an emotional acceptance We can intellectually be aware of the reasons for changes and and that it makes sense for them long before our emotions allow us to fully accept them. And that's related to the second task of grieving, to process the pain of grief. You see, it's nearly impossible to lose someone that you love or something that you have grown attached or accustomed to without experiencing some level of pain. And so your experience of faith are tied so strongly to your community here. And even if the faith itself isn't changing, some of the practical outward expressions have been and and will change. And it's okay to grieve those losses. It's okay to feel anger, to feel hurt, to feel frustration with the whole process of planning. Anger towards your priest previous priests, the archbishop. In in truth, it's really no one person's fault. And it's better to talk about what's going on inside rather than just to keep it bottled up. It's okay to feel guilt. Things that we should have done in the past that might have made a difference for the way things are now. It's okay to feel fear. That we may be anxious about the future not knowing what it will hold. And And I share this with you. You know, I'm fearful of not being able to serve this expanse of seven parishes. It's okay to be sad. I feel sad too. I wish that I could allot my time to just one single parish. 
but I can't. My priesthood will ever be divided, trying to serve many communities at once. And this, too, I must grieve. Anger, guilt, fear, anxiety, sadness, these are all natural expressions of mourning. But I don't want to leave you just with grief and our sadness, because we have faith in God after all, do we not? You know, if he can cleanse the leper, he can certainly bring good out of our sorrows. Even in the book of Lamentations in the Old Testament, which was written in mourning over the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, we see expressions of hope. This I will call to mind, therefore I will hope. The Lord's acts of mercy are not exhausted. His compassion is not spent. They are renewed each morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, I tell myself. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who trust in him, to the one that seeks him. You see, there is hope and joy in the future in our new parish family. God's mercies are not spent. Here at this Mass, take all that is within your heart and place it here upon his altar to unite yourself with Jesus and let him carry you. I want to conclude by drawing from a passage from a book called The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis. It's part of his Chronicles of Narnia series, if maybe some of you have read it. But if you're not familiar with his stories, Lewis uses allegory to teach children through these stories about God. And so in the series of books, the lion Aslan represents Jesus. And in this story in particular, there is a boy, Diggory, who has been drawn into the land of Narnia where he wishes to meet Aslan with the hope that Aslan will be able to heal his mother who is sick and dying. And when Diggory finally meets Aslan, it becomes clear that, that Aslan may not take away the pain in the way that which Diggory wishes he would. And so as I read this passage, see yourself in the person of Diggory, bringing your sorrows to God, and see in Aslan's response that of Jesus to you. But please, please, won't you, can't you give me something that will cure my mother? Up until then, Diggory had been looking at the lion's great front feet and huge claws on them. Now, in his despair, he looked up at his face. And what he saw surprised him as much as anything in his whole life. For the tawny face was bent down near his own, and wonder of wonders, great shining tears stood in the lion's eyes. They were such big, bright tears compared with Diggory's own that for a moment he felt as if the lion must really be sorrier about his mother than he was himself. My son, my son, said Aslan, I know, grief is great. Only you and I in this land know that yet. Let us be good to one another.